So today we're talking about this paper, which is a bit off the walls because they were able to like read people's minds using stable diffusion. So that's kind of whack. Um, so for instance, this was the image the person was looking at, and this was the image that was produced by stable diffusion when you looked at the person's brain. So that's literally mind reading. That is literally what mind reading is. So we have with psychic now, that's good. Computers are psychic. Let's just get into the technicals because we love the technicals. So let's get one of these diagrams up. Oh, look at that diagram, nice diagram. So this is how the study worked. The researchers showed images to participants and while they were showing the images to those participants, they also chucked those participants in this huge machine called an MRI machine. Technically, it was an fMRI machine, and what this fMRI machine does is it scans your brain and it creates a, a big map of your brain uh, and it tells you like which parts of your brain were really active at what time. So you end up with something that looks a bit like this, um, but it's actually like a, it's like 3D. Something like this here where the red bits are the bits that are really active in your brain. So it's like a really fancy 3D brain photograph. Okay, so fMRI machine, um, they get this voxel data because they're rather than pixels, they're not 2D pixels, they're 3D voxels. They get this data full of 3D voxels of brain activations from the fMRI machine, pass that to a stable diffusion algorithm, and basically without doing any kind of training or anything, or just doing like a marginal little sprinkling of training, because the authors, they're like, they're like brain people, you know? They're like biologists or something. They don't know how computers work. So they did a little bit of training, passed their data into Stable Diffusion, and Stable Diffusion reconstructed the original images. And, you know, anyone can do that. That's all fine. The crazy bit is that it actually, it actually kind of worked. And the images that they got out of Stable Diffusion actually kind of look like what the person was looking at. What a time to be alive is basically what I'm trying to say. Okay, but let's get a little more technical. Um, this is Stable Diffusion and we're gonna name a few different things, different things, because the paper uses those different names. And if you're trying to read the paper, this will make it way easier for you to do that. So stable diffusion, it's all about this unit, right? That the big stable diffusion unit. And the unit takes in two things. It takes in an image. And as well as the image, it takes in a text caption that describes that image. And the image gets passed to an autoencoder, which turns the image into this latent representation, which for the purposes of this paper is called Z. So that's one input to the model. Then there's also the text, which gets passed to a T5 encoder. And from that, you get a text embedding, which again in the paper is called C. Then you pass these two inputs, the Z and the C, into the unit, and it passes out an output, which we'll call ZC in this case, pretty reasonable. Um, and of course, this is just a latent, right? This is a latent, just like this is a latent. You know, units, they go from images to images, or in this case, latents to latents. So if you try to look at this, it would look like nonsense. Um, but then you pass it to the other half of the autoencoder from the beginning, and it takes that latent and it turns it back into an image, which hopefully, um, you know, will match the text prompt. And if you're doing image to image, it'll look a bit like the, um, the input image. Now, mostly at inference time with stable diffusion, you actually pass in some white noise and then slowly, slowly, using the text prompt, you generate an image from that. So ultimately your input is text and an image, um, which actually get encoded a little bit and you end up with this latent image Z and this conditioning uh, matrix C from the text. Okay, so that's how stable diffusion works. Hopefully that's all, you know, we've got the framework in place. Now this is what the authors did. They created two linear models. And the way that the first linear model worked, this was a text linear model. So the person was shown the image and when the person looked at the image, they scanned the person's brain. In fact, the researchers actually focused on a particular part of the brain, part of the occipital lobe, which is where all the image processing bits happen. Um, and they focused on like the higher portion of the occipital lobe, which is supposed to contain some more semantic details. Doesn't matter. They, they focused on a particular part of the brain. They took the voxels out of that part of the brain. They um, did some little pre-processing. We'll talk about it in just a second. And then the pre-processed uh, brain voxels were passed to a linear model. I'm actually really sad because the researchers haven't published their code yet as I'm making this video. So we don't know exactly what kind of uh, linear model we're dealing with here, but a linear model, they're simple, right? Linear models, they look like, like this. They're like, they're linear transforms and perhaps the linear model might've contained like a whole bunch of different linear transforms. But um, the main point to sort of keep in mind is that linear models are really simple. They have like two parameters as opposed to like 7 billion parameters. So linear models, very, very simple thingos. 
The goal of the linear model was to predict C. So C is the text embedding from the um, neural network. So to put that all in one, they showed an image to a person, scanned their brain, took that data from the brain, processed it a little bit, passed it to a linear model, and that linear model had to predict a text embedding, right? It had to predict the text associated with that image. And it just so happened that the images that people were being shown were from the MS Coco data set, I'm pretty sure. All the images had a text caption paired with them anyway. So we, we knew what the caption of each image was. And then to actually train that linear model, the authors just took the text that was associated with the image that the person was shown. They passed it to the T5 encoder. So it's exactly the same encoder as we usually use to encode text. And then they got the actual text embedding that should have existed in the first place. And then so they just compared these two text embeddings and they, um, you know, to the extent they didn't match up, they just punished the model. And if they did match up, they rewarded the model. And in the end, we end up with a linear model that produces like a reasonable estimation of what the actual text embedding was. Sort of broadly, you can think you show a person an image and then you try to predict what the semantics of that image were, i.e what the semantics of the text caption associated with that image was. Okay, so that's one of the linear models. Nice, good. Before we talk about the other one, I just want to mention that this is not happening in real time. So when I talk about scanning a person in the fMRI machine, what actually happened is that these guys, these, these other researchers um, from this project called the Neural Scenes Dataset, went ahead and scanned, I think, up like nine or 10 participants and in a really, really good fMRI machine using really good um, practices and stuff. And they built a whole bunch of infrastructure around this data they collected and they collected over like 12 months and they did the best possible things and it was really good. So the researchers from our paper, Mr. Takagi and Nishimoto, they're not actually scanning anyone's brain. Our heroes are just using data that, of brain scans that already exists. Um, so just wanted to give a lot of credit to this project because it's a really, really goddamn cool project. Yeah, so just keep that in mind. There are no live participants being shown images. That all happened like 21 months ago, and now we're dealing with the data that's sitting there. So that's why it's so easy to train all this, because, you know, you're not having to like tell participants to sit still and stuff. You're just like grabbing data from different pipelines and feeding it through. Okay, so the second linear model was pretty similar. Um, they showed the participant an image, they scanned the lower area of the occipital lobe instead of the, um, the higher area, area, the lower area, which is supposed to have less semantics and more like low level details. Um, they grabbed that data, pre-processed it, passed it to a linear model, and the goal of the linear model was to predict Z, Z being um, this bit, right? It's the latent. Now, I'm not exactly sure how they trained this model exactly. If you look at the actual paper itself, uh, what they did is they predicted this Z, which was then passed to a decoder, which turned the Z into an image. Um, so presumably uh, this Z has information that has to do with this image. So this Z has you know, some sort of encoded image information. So they took that encoded image information, actually extracted it out into a proper image. And then they fed that image into the normal stable diffusion encoder. And then that's how they got their latent. Right, so they, they weren't actually predicting the stable diffusion latent directly. They're predicting this Z, which can be decoded into an image, which can then be encoded into the latent. Um, but if we sort of ignore this, if we just sort of bundle all of, all, of, all of this whole thing from here to here up into one thing, it's sort of like you have a linear model that predicts Z. The point was they didn't train any of this other stuff themselves. The only thing they trained was the thing that output the, the Z. Um, and that was again a linear model. So now we have two linear models. One that you can use to scan the brain and give you text encoding information. And one that you can use to scan the brain and give you a latent representation. So all we have to do is put those together, right? The text one and the image one. And now you have everything you need to just do some stable diffusion. Like you feed a brain an image, you use these two linear models to extract text and image information from that brain, and then you can just perform a stable diffusion like normal, right? You just plug these new C and Z matrices in where the old ones were and the unit doesn't know. You know, it just thinks it's dealing with normal image data, which in theory means that you could just like plug your brain 
up into a computer and then just think really hard like oh big man thick man greg ratowski hot sexy uh cosplay uh berserk and it'll give you that in theory <laughs> and again here we have the results so like you know you can look at these in your own time but like you know they were able to reconstruct a train and a teddy bear and like a plane to be fair these are like um they cherry picked a little bit i think these are like the best of five or something i don't know exactly but it works it, it fucking works somehow <laughs> but our heroes our, our dauntless champions over here were not done they were like you know what we've already um we've already made a, a system that can like print what you're thinking about onto a big screen why don't we go one step further and try to reverse that process we're gonna give it an image give it some text and then predict what your brain would do if it saw that image right this seems nuts you shouldn't be able to do that there shouldn't be enough information in stable diffusion to give you any kind of idea about what's going on inside my brain the authors actually tried to do this in a few different ways i'm just going to talk about one of their strategies um, so this strategy was they took an image, passed it into Stable Diffusion. Obviously, we know what the Stable Diffusion unit light looks like. You've got layers, uh, so the input will get passed into the layer. And then a bunch of processing happens, and it comes out the other side as uh, some activations, as some weights. You pass in the image, out come the weights. And then you pass the weight to the next layer, and then a bunch of processing happens, and then they come out the other side as new weights, and then so on and so forth. Um, and what they did is they would grab a linear model and the linear model would try to predict the brain activations of the entire human brain when looking at that image. So pretty big task. Um, but yeah, so it takes in activations, tries to predict the brain. Then you train this by showing the brain the same image. Of course, they have a data set where the brain already was shown the image. They already have that. Um, you get the, the brain voxels out of the brain. And then you just compare the predicted to the actual voxels and you just keep on updating the linear model. Again, linear model, right? We're talking about one of these. We're talking about this kind of nonsense. Um, yeah, you keep updating the linear model and then eventually you'll get uh, a linear model that's like good in theory. And of course, if someone had asked me beforehand, hey, do you think this would work, Luca? I'd be like, no, and I'm willing to bet my entire life savings on that. So the researchers made like a bunch of identical linear models. The only difference would be that they would take different layers as input. All of them would do the exact same thing, try to predict exactly what the brain would look like. And here are the results. So first thing to note is that the authors don't talk about how accurate they were at predicting brain pixels. Uh, without going too crazy into the stats here, it basically means that all the colored in pixels, these were predicted better than random. Like significantly, definitely better than random. Now, that probably means that they weren't predicted like way better than random, because otherwise the authors would be talking about how good that those results had been. So the prediction probably wasn't super accurate, but it's still, we're talking about better than random prediction of particular voxels inside the brain. The interesting thing that the authors found with this strategy is they found that the linear model whose input was coming from the center, that particular linear model seemed to have the best predictive power early on in the diffusion process. Right, when there's, the image is basically noise. But as the diffusion process proceeds and we get less and less noise in the image, other layers, like the earlier layer and um, some even earlier layers, end up having more predictive power. So that says two things. One kind of insane, wild, wacky, crazy thing to begin with, which is that somehow stable diffusion, the model that Emad and his boys made, that model is so like the brain it has so much analogy and similarity to the human brain that using a simple linear model you can take some of its activations and predict better than random what's going to happen inside the brain so stable diffusion in the brain are somehow kind of similar the other thing it seems to imply is that as the diffusion process proceeds different layers kind of play different roles. So this seems to suggest, for instance, that whatever's going on in this part of the brain, well, the middle layers of stable diffusion are do that at the beginning of the diffusion process. But as the diffusion process proceeds, the part of stable diffusion that does whatever activity happens here uh, shifts. 
to be an earlier layer of stable diffusion. <laughs> it is obviously made a lot harder because you don't actually know what the hell these parts of the brain are doing. It's really hard to tell. But different bits of stable diffusion seem to play different roles as the diffusion process progresses, which is something that would be kind of surprising. That surprised me at least. Okay, just one more thing to keep in mind. These two guys, as legendary and giga chat as they are, are not the first to do this. There are other researchers who've been doing very similar things where they've shown people pictures and then recreated what the picture would look like um, and done it with like a reasonable level of accuracy before. These are the first ones to use stable diffusion and are the first ones to get images that look this damn good. Don't think that these guys have just like clicked their fingers and created lightning from a bottle. Um, everyone is always standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay, so summing up, what the authors did is they created a pipeline where you show a person an image scan their brain and then from the brain scan reconstruct the same image and they did so with very high fidelity very impressive and then they also did the reverse process where they took an image uh, along with some text passed it to stable diffusion and then predicted how brain scans would look if you scanned the person's brain while they were looking at that image that's almost a bit more mind-blowing to me right like that's at this point we're starting to like see into people's brains a bit which is a little bit odd and weird. And because these pipelines were so simple, it was just stable diffusion plus a linear transform or two, what this means is that there's a lot of similarity between stable diffusion, the model that we use to generate waifu and God knows what else, and the human brain. Those two are a bit similar somehow. Okay, video away, video away, done. One more thing I wanna mention. So the Koi Boy video creation process is actually really complicated. And how it works is that this particular guy, Yatharth, the second name, will come and visit me on Discord and he'll be like, Luca, I found a cool paper. It's called High Resolution Image Reconstruction with Latent Diffusion Mold for Human Brain. He'll, he'll, he'll say that or he'll say, oh, you know, guess what? Chat GPT-7 is about to drop, right? And then based on that, I'll read that, I'll lose my mind for a few days and then I'll make a video. That's how it works. So if you want exclusive access, early access to all Koi Boy content, um, just follow this guy. Just follow this guy and see what he posts and you'll know it'll turn up here eventually. Okay, good, thanks.